welcome to the State of the University Address. It's just now past our, our starting time, so we'll begin today's event with our land acknowledgement statement. As a land-grant institution, the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign has a responsibility to acknowledge the historical context in which it exists. In order to remind ourselves and our community, we begin with this statement. We are currently on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankashaw, Wea, Miami, Muscoutin, Odawa, Sauk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. It is necessary for us to acknowledge these native nations and for us to work with them as we move forward as an institution. Over the next 150 years, we will be a vibrant community, inclusive of all our differences, with native peoples at the core of our efforts. Good afternoon. My name is Bill Bernhardt. Uh, I have the good fortune of being interim provost this year, and I would like to welcome everyone to Chancellor Jones's annual State of the University Address. We're exceptionally excited today because we're combining that address with the kickoff of our strategic planning process as we move toward our new strategic plan, Boldly, Illinois. Our plan is to hear from Chancellor Jones, uh, and then at the conclusion of his address, we'll wrap that up around 1250, take a short break, and then continue on uh, with the Strategic Planning Summit kickoff event. So uh, for Chancellor Jones' remarks, uh, following his, uh, following his uh, prepared uh, speech, I'll act as moderator and pose some questions to him that we get from our audience. We have a few questions that were already submitted in advance, but we also have note cards available by the doors if you'd like to submit one during the event. Just write it down and hold it up and one of our staff members around the room will come and get it. So the ground rules established, it's now my great pleasure to introduce Chancellor Jones to give his perspective on the state of our university today.
Thank you, Provost Bernhard, and thanks to each and every one of you for joining us today, whether in person at the Illini Union or watching virtually. And I also want to extend a very, very special thank you to the distinguished guests and members of the Illinois family who will be standing at this podium a little later. So welcome to Dr. Freeman Rabrowski, the recently retired and legendary president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And an equally warm welcome to Dr. Ruth Watkins, the former president of the University of Utah and currently the president of Strata Impact. President Rabowski holds two degrees and an honorary degree from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and President Watkins spent much of her academic year, career here, first as a faculty member and later served as the vice provost and ultimately as dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. So both have very, very important connections to this place. And today is, I hope, a very happy homecoming for each of you. But please make no mistake about it. We're very happy to see them back, but in keeping with our commitment to engage people, we intend to put them to work for their university today. <laughs> you know, since I joined Illinois in 2016, my State of the University address has become kind of an annual tradition. But this year, it would be a bit different. This year, we are linking my remarks with our university's strategic planning summit. And we will be opening that summit with a conversation, actually, with President Rybrowski and President Watkins. So yes, for those of you who are already thinking it, I'll just say it out loud. I am, in fact, the opening act for the Freeman Rybrowski and Ruth Watkins <laughs> show. <laughs> And I promise you that that's a tour that I'd be excited to join at any time and any place. <laughs> it's pretty good work if you can get it. <laughs> Ruth and Freeman, it is truly my pleasure to have you both join us for the launch of the planning of the next phase of our university's strategic plan. And I, like all of us, are looking to forward to your remarks. And I hope that my comments in some way help set the framework for the conversation that we'll be engaging in later this afternoon. The future of this university, and more specifically and strategically positioning ourselves for that future, was my focus as I started to really think about what I would say to you today. And the coincidence of good timing that has allowed us to combine this event with our strategic planning summit really crystallized that approach. I am extremely proud that even though the frequent and seamlessly endless cycle of COVID-19 uncertainty, this university has continued to move forward in every aspect of our mission. But we all know that effort slowed some of the tremendous momentum that we had going into 2020. The pandemic appears to be waning somewhat, and some of that weight has certainly been lifted from us this year. We now have the luxury and the capacity to raise our sights a, a little further afield, and we have the chance to consider how we orient ourselves to provide the solutions our community, our state, and our nation will need to rebuild and to recover. The overriding question for me became how would I characterize the way I believe we should position ourselves for that future? And you know the answer was sitting right in front of me. And it has been there since March of 2020 when I had to send everyone home. It has been manifested in every action we have taken together. And it has and I have seen in every different decision, in every decision we've made among our faculty and our staff, 
have made to protect, protect themselves and one another. So we certainly are a university that believes that when we think big and when we act boldly, the world changes for the better. And we've got 155 years of legendary scholars and graduates and accomplishments to back that up. Our response to COVID-19 very clearly reminded us that this spirit of innovation and accomplishment that is in our DNA is just as vibrant and just as important today as it was in 1867. Every time Illinois focuses our collective attention on sovereign problems everyone else says are impossible, they have to rewrite the definition of that blanket blank word. So the state of the university today is one that is boldly shaping our future together. I do want to really clarify something that I said a few minutes ago when I suggested that the pandemic had taken some momentum away. That is certainly not a criticism and it is not any kind of negative reflection on our accomplishments. Rather, it is a testament to our university's commitment to putting the greater good of our community above our individual goals and agendas. And instead of using this pandemic as an excuse to stand still or to wait to follow the lead of other institutions, we instead use what we learn in these very hard times to reframe and refocus every aspect of our mission and preparation for what society will need to rebuild and to recover. So it may be today's theme, but we started demonstrating what boldly Illinois really means on March 16th of 2020. And we have not looked back or slowed down since that day. And in fact, I believe we have reminded ourselves that when the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign talks about solving the grand challenges of our time, that isn't just a slogan, it's a promise that we mean to keep. Now let me be perfectly clear. When you start to look at our accomplishments this past year, what we consider losing some momentum, most other universities will call a year of historic proportions. All of you, all you have to do is just look at our new undergraduate class to see that an Illinois experience remains in very, very high demand among our students and across our state, across the nation, and around the world. We welcome our second largest first year class ever, and our total enrollment reached a 155-year high. We have students from 52 countries around the world, and with more than 70% coming from right here in the state of Illinois. We are, again, by far the largest provider of undergraduate education in the state of Illinois, and I am particularly proud to say that the percentage of first-year college students increased significantly this year, up to 23%, our highest number ever. And thanks to innovative ideas like Illinois Commitment, our promise of four years of free tuition and fees, to admitted Illinois residents with family income of $67,100 or less, access to the best education in the world remains very, very affordable. And as I speak today, there are more than 6,000 students who have found an Illinois education attainable thanks to Illinois commitment. So we aren't just admitting and enrolling these students. We are continually improving the support and the academic programs that we offer to ensure that they will find success, that they will walk away from here with a degree in hand. I'm so, so proud that our six-year graduation rate is 84%. And I remind you, 
I remind you that this is 32 percentage points higher than the average for four-year universities in this country. We also continue to provide new support programs outside of the classroom that's just as critical to their success. We launched a successful and very well-received program of online scheduling of student appointments for counseling services. And we have funded seven new permanent staff positions for embedded counselors in units across the campus to put more support in closer proximity. And we have begun hiring staff members who will lead the creation of a new basic needs center that will act as a virtual and physical hub to support students in accessing the essential services that impact mental health, a sense of belonging, and improving their overall well-being at this university. And when they graduate, our students continue to find themselves starting their career with debt far below the national average. More than half, more than half of our graduates leave with zero debt. That's zero debt. And I'm going to say that once more because sometimes when I say that, people look at me with great skepticism when I say that the first time. So more than half of our graduates leave this university with no debt. And for those who do have loans, the average amount they owe is right around $23,000. An Illinois education for the equivalent of a new car loan seems like a pretty good long-term investment to me. And those new graduates continue to find their first post-college destination at a truly astonishing pace. Last year, 94% of our 2021 graduates had secured their first destination within six months of earning their degrees. And for those who took full-time jobs, the average starting salary was $69,000. So let me be clear. More access, more affordable, more success, less debt, more opportunity. Just 10 words that I've just spoken, I believe made the most compelling and I think the most powerful case for the value proposition of an Illinois education that, frankly, I can imagine. And we know that world-class students are coming here because the, world, the word is out that this is the place where you will find truly world-class faculty waiting to meet you. And I don't know if this year has really set a historic record for faculty honors and award, but it has been the most impressive list of honors that I've seen since I arrived at this great university. There was a Guggenheim. There were two new members of the Academy, American Academy of Arts and Sciences. There was one national endowment for the arts recipient. We had 14 new members to join the American Academy for the Advancement of Sciences. There were 15 NSF Career Award recipients on this campus last year. And this fall, one of our faculty received the Cavalier Prize in Nanoscience, an award that regularly precedes a Nobel Prize. Three new members were inducted into the National Academy of Engineering. There was one new member of the National Academy of Sciences. And with last week's news of a new member of the National Academy of, e of Medicine, I think we pretty much have a sweep of all the national academies this year. <laughs> our infrastructure for scholarship and research continues to grow across our entire enterprise. Last year, we saw $731 million in research expenditures, and that was up more than five percentage points over the previous year. And it was the sixth consecutive year of growth. Yes, that's exactly right. Our research enterprise has grown throughout the pandemic. And this isn't just about the dollar figures, folks. 
from better understanding of autism to advancing quantum computing to tackling political coups around the world and understanding this, the scope of our research and our scholarship is what we mean when we are talking about inclusive innovation. We also continue to demonstrate to our, our land-grant mission. We continue to demonstrate that this comes with the responsibilities to step beyond our classroom and our libraries and our research facilities in order to engage with the communities. And I know you've heard me say that several times during my six-year tenure at this university. We really do have to engage with communities. So we, are collab we collaborated with Shield CU and Shield Illinois to promote key free COVID-19 testing to our local communities. We, inform, uh, we formed the Coordinating Council for Public Engagement designed to really affect greater campus-wide strategies to help achieve even more national recognition as a premier land-grant university, publicly engaged institution of higher education. We utilize our University of Chicago, Illinois partnership to address business diversity, youth entrepreneurship, K through 12 education, and urban research as a companion initiative to the Chicago Quantum Exchange. And this summer, we convene the Champaign Urbana Anchor Institution. Call on Carl Illinois College of Business, uh, Carl Illinois and uh, Business, uh, Busey uh, Bank, OSF, Christie, and United Way to provide $3,000 of support to the initiative called Victory Over Violence that was designed to address gun violence right here in our community. And if you were wondering how our community and our alums and our friends around the world responded when they see their university acting boldly and acting with great purpose, that was certainly on full display just two weeks ago. During one of the biggest celebrations that we've had on campus during homecoming and foundation week, we also wrapped up the most ambitious philanthropic campaign in our history. So when I stepped onto that very big stage in 2017 and announced to the world that our With Illinois campaign was going to raise $2.25 billion in five years, there were a lot of people who told me, Jones, there's no way a public university can meet that kind of goal. Now I do have to publicly admit that the skeptics got at least part of it right. We did not raise $2.25 billion in five years. We got there in four years. And we just kept going until we reached a final figure, just short of $2.7 billion. And I want to say that once more because it sounds so good rolling off my tongue. <laughs> That's $2.7 billion with a capital B. And we did it in the middle of the worst global health crisis in memory. So that is really the kind of year that we're having. And we're starting to truly recover and I think rebuild to our pre-COVID-19 momentum. We believe and we are, we, that we are truly hitting our stride again, folks. The confidence and the faith that we've found in ourselves these last three years has really given us a new sense of freedom. We've learned that even as an institution of our size and our scale and our scope, that we actually can turn on a dime. And we understand that we're coming out of a very dark tunnel into a world that no longer has time nor the patience for the way that things used to be done. So this is the heart and actually the soul of Boldly, Illinois. Maybe for the first time in a century, we have an open lane to lay out a new vision and a new plan for the future of our university. And we're beginning to set that common and shared foundation 
is really what this conversation is all about today. But I also want to challenge you all to fearlessly embrace the ideas of thinking big and dreaming boldly as we move forward as a university. So I want us to pursue the coming year with the same kind of audacity and courage that led our university to create the first engineering-based college of medicine in the world. Carl, Illinois went from being an interesting idea to graduating the first class of physician innovators in less than 10 years. And you know, in doing so, it is catapulting our university-wide health sciences and innovation ecosystem to even greater heights. We have leveraged our preeminence in basic sciences and engineering and social sciences, and we've created an enterprise of discovery that touches on everything from new drug development to exploration of inequalities in care to our transdisciplinary cancer center and our cancer center at Illinois. And I can tell you again that we're absolutely determined to make the Cancer Center in Illinois the largest, the most impactful basic cancer research center in this country. And I'm excited to announce for the first time right here, right now, today, that effort is going to dramatically accelerate when we start to construction on the new state-of-the-art building for our new cancer center that is going to be located in the University Avenue Medical District. That will be the physical home of our cancer center in Illinois. This will, of course, be very complementary to our translational research facility, which will also be built as a part of our state's investment in DPI, or Discovery Partners Institute. It is also time, I believe, for this university to be as bold and imaginative in shaping our research practices around climate change, clean energy, the environment, as we have seen in medicine and in healthcare. So I believe we have the greatest accumulation, folks, of expertise in the world in these fields, but they are distributed throughout our university. I think that it's high time that we assemble those components into a comprehensive stat strategy that, that really links these things together in a way that's sustainable and will have the greatest impact. And just like we have learned from health sciences, the whole becomes magnitude greater than the sum of its parts. We need to be equally bold and unapologetic when it comes to facing the persistent and the continued pandemic of system, systemic racism and inequality that is as much of a threat to our well-being as a society as rising temperatures of floods. We have taken, I believe, significant leaps forward with our call to action. The first two years of collaborative research projects and initiatives that really built new connections to our community in seamless ways. And they're already creating new avenues and new methods of both scholarly exploration and discourse around some of the most divisive and I think the most difficult issues of our time. We see that kind of bold thinking in the incorporation of DEI issues into our promotion and tenure evaluation. And we see it in our expanding investments in people and programs to put Native people truly at the center of our education and our research and our engagement mission. But the call to action must also be a unrelenting expectation that this university will embed diversity, equity, and inclusion in our DNA in the same way that we have done with innovation and invention. What I'm saying is that we must become equally bold in stepping outside of our traditional university conference zone. If we are truly to deliver on our land grant mission in the most effective far-reaching and I believe sustainable ways. 
the model for community engagement today is one where universities like ours are present in communities by their invitation. And because they want us there, because we have resources to help them address whatever set of challenges they say are important. The old adage that we're from the university and we're here to help just won't cut it any longer. So we need to find ways to build our relationship and our partnership with agencies and organizations that are known and trusted in those communities already. For example, our partnership in East St. Louis with the Jack and Johnny Kersey Foundation is just one example. We have enormous resources for education and outreach, but we have a limited presence and limited exposure in that community. The JJK Foundation has unlimited trust and support and deep connections in this region. So we are there with them, but it's a relationship that is driven by that community priorities and that community's needs. And if you want an example of the payoff of these big, bold partnerships, I would just point you to our first year as a founding university partner with something called Hope Chicago. And I certainly hope all of you have heard of Hope Chicago before. I remind you, Hope Chicago is a privately funded, it is a privately funded nonprofit that has set out a goal of providing debt free college education to 30,000 Chicago public school students and their parents within the next decade. So folks, I have to tell you, this is one of the most exciting things that I've been engaged with in more than 43 years of trying to open the pathway to educational success. So this year, we had 139 HOPE-sponsored applicants for our fall class. We extended offers to 54 of them. 30 of those students actually accepted our offer and or enrolled at this university today. I think some of you know that our annual yield rates from our traditional admission recruitment processes are somewhere between 30 and 40 percent range. Through our Hope Chicago partnership, we saw a nearly 50 percent yield rate with students in one of the most important state school district. So we must also be bold when it comes to our willingness to recognize that our land grant educational responsibility for the 21st century. And we have to really think hard about that, how a 21st century society means that we need to rethink some long-held traditional practices of our university. And high, now I do not see a future, and I want to be clear about this because people get a little nervous when we start to talk about this, but I want to be clear, I do not see a future where, there were, where we will ever stop offering world-class residential undergraduate and graduate degree programs. But I think at the same time, to be the land-grant university of the 21st century, we must recognize that we have an obligation to provide education and training to a new and less traditional cohort of learners who would need access to education that is flexible, a cohort that would also need more direct upskilling and reskilling opportunities throughout their lives. So for us, as this world-class research university and provider of world-class education, the fundamental question for us is how do we create certificates, credential programs for non-traditional students? How do we do the laddering or stacking of those in ways that allow for eventually a degree attainment in non-traditional timeframes through a combination of on-campus, online, and hybrid delivery models? So in essence, how do we go back to many of the workforce and skill development services that we offered our community back in 1867 while still providing a 
traditional residential graduate and undergraduate program and doing it at scale and doing it with the excellence that we are known for. And we need to be bold in our geography. We also must have a comprehensive and international and global perspective in forming every one of our goals that we set, even those that seem to be locally oriented. It is time for us to, I believe, fully embrace the fact that the responsibility of being a land-grant university in the 21st century requires us to be geographically anchored in the community around us, but operating on a global scale. And when we approach that from that perspective, we can seamlessly integrate the, and embed this global vision and prioritization within our institutional academic educational and research DNA. Our land grant mission has always been to serve our community. And we just need to find new ways to redefine the boundaries of what we consider as our community. And finally, we must be bold and unwavering when it comes to the investments we make in the people and the programs that ultimately define our university. The new strategic faculty hiring initiative we announced last month is a good example of what I mean. This is at minimum a $50 million plan to aggressively and very publicly accelerate our efforts to recruit and hire the best and the brightest faculty on the planet. And now I know that number raises some eyebrows when we put it out there, but and we also have a lot of discussions around what we should call that program. But I'll tell you right now what I call it. I call it a good start. Because that's just what it is. It is the first step. And we must be just as aggressive in compensating and retaining the talent that we have right now at this university as we continue to recruit the next wave of talented faculty and staff. And we know that we need to make, we need to be making equally significant investments in retaining our current faculty. And we know that compensation, support, and continued professional growth and development of our staff must be addressed with an equal sense of urgency. And we are fully committed to making those investments, folks. So I want to be very clear about that. In fact, if you started to add up all the new investments from the hiring program, but those that we already have on the way or have built into our budget model and our plans, we're going to be committing at least $1.3 billion to operationalize and support our academic and research infrastructure in the next four years. Now let me be very clear, I'm not saying that we are going to be somehow or another coming into a $1.3 billion worth of new money. I'm talking about strategically and intentionally looking at all of our funding sources from gifts to capital funds and investing more than a billion dollars directly in what matters the most. That's our people and our programs. So this is a massive commitment of resources. This is a massive commitment of resources, but it's one that I can explain and justify without hesitation and without qualification. Because I know what the people of this university can and will do with this level of investment. I know it because I have seen it in every day since I had the pleasure of arriving here in 2016. You will do the impossible. You will change the world. You know, as we stand here today for the first time in several frantic and really frightening and unpredictable years, it really feels good to me. It feels like we have found a welcome and, and I believe a much needed calm harbor. This is our opportunity to really kind of regroup and reimagine and recommit to our land grant mission of learning, discovery, engagement, and service to our community, and service of those community who needs us the most.
I feel like institutionally and personally, we have the rare opportunity to simply breathe. And I use that word with purpose and with full awareness of its weight. I've talked often and openly since 2020 about the twin pandemic facing our society, COVID-19 and systemic racism and inequality. And as we all know, whether you are replaying the final pleas from George Floyd or the devastating images of so many COVID-19 victims passing along, hooked up to ventilators, the simple act of breathing is something that none of us will ever again take for granted. COVID-19 is certainly not behind us. But thankfully, it seems to be receding. And every day seems to bring vaccines and new treatments and earlier detection methods. But racism, inequality, and the correlated individual and community damage they bring are certainly not vanishing. But I believe that we have seen the dawn of a new, deeper, and a broader societal commitment to face these issues more honestly and hopefully more effective than any other time in the history of this country. So in this rare moment and the bubble of relatively quiet and safety, I hope that we all will take a long, deep, and collective breath to remember what we have come through together. And also to finally and fully grieve for those that we have lost in these very, very hard and difficult times. You know, I realize that I've talked a great deal today about moving forward and thinking boldly. So it may seem a little out of place for me to end my remarks in this way. But I think it is important to understand that being bold doesn't mean being loud, and it certainly doesn't mean being bolsters. It takes tremendous courage, and I think conviction, conviction to, honestly, to honestly understand where we have been and to honestly understand what we have overcome, what we've come through, and the cost of that journey. A truly bold university is one that is determined to use this momentum to move fearlessly forward. But a bold university is also unafraid to critically and honestly examine its past in order to shape a more strategic and a more equitable future for everyone. So here at Illinois, we've always led our actions our discovery, our ideas, and our values speak for themselves. And as the events of the past three years have reminded us, when this university stands up and steps forward and applies its collective will to the grandest challenges, lives are saved, communities grow stronger, and the world becomes just a little bit better for us all. That is the bold Illinois that I see. It is my great honor and my great privilege to serve as your chancellor, and I just want to again thank you all for joining us today. Thank you so much. Chancellor, yes, sir. it's a heck of an opening act. I bet the headliners are going to be just as good. No about that. <laughs> so uh, we uh, have, have a few questions uh, that were pre-submitted. Also, if you have questions that you would like to submit, uh, we, 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 do, uh, we got started a little late, so we don't have time to address all of them, but please do share them with our staff members. Uh, we will respond, and we will get the information out there to, uh, to the community uh, that you're curious about. 
Uh, but we do have a, a couple questions sure. uh, uh, just uh, 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 here. Um, uh, in 1968, there was a push here at the University of Illinois with Project 500 to urge the university to enroll traditionally underrepresented students uh, into the university. The call to action to address racism and social injustice program is currently being funded for local projects. What further efforts are being planned to recruit more marginalized, underrepresented students to campus? Well, I think that's a critically important question and one that we've taken very seriously at this university because one of the things that you probably have sounded a broke, like a broken record about is access and affordability. And yes, the Project 500 was a great idea during its time. Uh, it will not, that kind of strategy, we have to think of beyond that to, to things that are gonna be more sustainable and more impactful. And just to give you a good example of what I'm talking about, we're embarking on something that's part of a, a system-wide initiative for all three universities to be a bit bolder and a bit more nimble and aggressive about keeping education accessible and affordable. How do we be more aggressive at really recruiting, recruiting and retaining and educating? You know, I get a little hung up when people only talk about the recruitment side because if the recruitment to what? Access to what? They have to have access to a degree and access to a career. So we are very, very proud of what we've done so far. We've invested, I think, Bill all in probably 40 to $50 million more in financial aid than we were investing when I came here in 2016. That's how you get to the more than 50% of our students having zero debt. And the other part of the, the core part of this question is how do you recruit more students from underrepresented, low social economic background. The Illinois commitment was a great start in that regard. And certainly you, Hope Chicago, just watch Hope Chicago. That is going to be a game changer, folks, because we know fundamentally, one of the problems we've been having with yield, the reason it's only 30 to 40%, is because people want an Illinois degree. But when it comes to taking our offer, that maybe covers tuition and fees and maybe a little bit else, other places are offering full ride scholarships. And that's the value proposition of Hope Chicago. And that's why you marked my word, our yield will grow up and we're going to have more underrepresented students from not just black and brown students, but students from low social economic background enrolling at this university in the future. And then to cap it all off, I didn't talk in great detail about this, but one of the things we are committed to do as a part of Access 2030 that we are gonna reframe it to talk just not about access, but uh, you know, uh, access to a career, is we've made a commitment to significantly uh, increase the number of students from underrepresented groups and to close that graduation gap that I talked about, that 84%. Well, if you look at African-American students, it's probably close to about 78%. And for Latinx students, the gap is a little smaller, but it's a gap nonetheless. And so we're gonna be investing our time and our energy and resources to get more students of color, more underrepresented students, more students from Central and Southern, more students from Carbondale into this great university. And we wanna make sure that they come here and they're part of that, uh, that cohort that graduates with zero or so close to zero that it is negligible. And so we're gonna be doing that and we made a commitment to, fund the, to, to frame the strategy and to spend the resources to close that gap in the next seven years. That is not easy, folks, but it's a commitment that we're absolutely intend on honoring and part of it is gonna have to do with us rethinking some of our relationships with community colleges. We have a great transfer strategy with them now, but it could be better. So we're gonna be unpacking all of the critical steps. You know, we're a research university. We have to be data driven. We know what the problem is. We gotta move from admiring and complaining about the problem to actually doing something about it. And I could not be more excited about what we will demonstrate and our path to the next seven years to really have this place to more closely reflect 
the population of these unrepresented groups in this state. And just getting them in here is one thing. We want them to graduate at the same rate as majority students. And that's a commitment that we're making as we commit to moving this university to the next level of excellence. And I remind you, that is a big, bold step on part of this university. Uh, I can tell you, I don't think we would have had the wherewithal to even think about doing something like this five or six years ago. But by the momentum and the support that we're giving from the governor's office, from the state and other places, our philanthropic support that is largely focused on scholarship support, I think we can get there. All right, well, thank you, Chancellor Jones. I appreciate you sharing uh, your perspective on campus today uh, and giving us a, an honest, assessment, honest and transparent assessment of where we are and where we're going. Thank you. I uh, really appreciate it. <laughs> Now we're going to take a 10-minute break. Uh, there are some refreshments around. Uh, get up and stretch your legs. Uh, and this is intermission. And then we'll come back for the, for the big show.
Good afternoon. Two minute warning. Huh? Well, I, I thought it was uh, appropriate to wear the new bucket hat. Thank you. Since uh, crafting this new strategic plan is definitely on my bucket list, so. Anyway, all seriousness. So let me start by saying good afternoon and again welcome to the second part of today's program, the opening conversation of Boldly Illinois, our strategic planning summit. And for those of you who were here in person or watching my State of the University address, welcome back. And for those of you who are just joining us now, I'm only slightly offended, but I'll get over it. But I understand the star power of our two featured speakers this afternoon. Dr. Freeman Rabowski and Ruth Watkins are both higher education thought leaders, and I would also add innovators as well as world-class scholars and administrators. Both have been extremely successful in their respected presidential roles, and I sincerely hope that both tell us today that careful and collective and actionable strategic planning really is the key to unifying theory and for our universities like ours when it comes to really trying to find that equilibrium and that bold vision and to sort out the competitive priorities and the practical realities that we need to consider as we move forward with the next iteration of our strategic plan. And for those of you who heard my remarks earlier, I hope you'd agree that we are a university that really has navigated an unprecedented period of crisis and risk in ways that really has allowed us not to slow down in so many ways, but to build new momentum and finding new paths for us to move forward. And I, can, I wanna just, just say this, I just came from the AAU meetings uh, out in Washington, D.C., and we had 57 of the 65 AA universities present. And I was really gratified with the number of university presidents and chancellors that came up to me and made comments about how this university handled itself in the most darkest days of this climate. So folks, don't think that others haven't noticed the sacrifice and the innovation and the strategies that you brought to the table. And I just want to again personally thank you all for how you work together as a university community to keep yourselves and to keep others safe. I believe that our preparedness in the midst of this crisis was certainly no accident. It was due in significant part to the foundation of resilience, flexibility, being very proactive, and the really innovative collective strategy that we built about five years ago that we so boldly called the next 150 strategic plan. You know, even when the world seems to be spinning out of control, we had a very clear vision and a very clear path of what we absolutely had to do to move forward. And it first of all started with innovation and everything else trickled up or down from there. And extending that bright path into the next five years is the goal of our Boldly Illinois planning process. And I, I wanna thank you all for joining us and I sincerely hope that you will be actively engaged, and I want to emphasize the word actively engaged in the plan as it takes shape across the rest of this academic year and beyond. And beyond. You know, I've been standing at this podium what seems like a very long time today, and I'm sure most of you feel the same way, if not even more so. 
So I think it's long past time for me to move to the sidelines and turn the podium over to our two very special guests for our conversation uh, this afternoon and get that conversation after, on the way. They, I will offer some very brief introductory thoughts and comments about each of them. And then I will be joining them on the stage uh, and Provost uh, Bernhardt will be moderating a conversation based on questions from the audiences and the note cards that are available in the back of the room in case you haven't had a chance to, to write down a question, I would encourage you to do so. And if you would like to submit a question, uh, please, please write it down. I encourage you to do that because that's going to help shape where this plan, you know, how, how we get started is going to determine how we, what we end up. And this is the critical point of departure today. So I really encourage you to participate. So let me begin the, with a bit of more formal introduction of both of them. And uh, I'm going to just stick to the basics. Uh, uh, and I truly want to give justice, however, to their respective amazing, amazing careers and accomplishments. Um, and we could not be more proud to have the two of you with us today. I know how busy both of you are, and the fact that you took time out to be here means a lot to all of us. So I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Ruth Watkins, who's the president of Strata Impact. She leads Strata Educational Network efforts to engage, enable more individuals to begin and to successfully complete post-secondary education. What a novel idea, Ruth to begin and to complete post-secondary education. I think you all know that prior to John and Strata in 2021, Dr. Watkins served as the 16th president of the University of Utah. After serving for five years as a senior vice president for academic affairs, she moved to Utah following a 20-year career in leadership and faculty roles right here at the University of Illinois at Banner champaign yeah, Absolutely, that's, yeah, absolutely. She was tenured as a faculty member in the College of Applied Health Sciences and served as vice provost and became the dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. She earned a PhD in child language uh, from the University of Kansas, and her scholarship focused on communication development and disability in young children. So Ruth, welcome back home. Glad to have you with us today. Our first speaker is, of course, Dr. Freeman Rabowski, who retired this summer after serving as the president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County since 1992. Under his leadership, UMBC became a nationally recognized leader in participation and in the success of underrepresented students, but particularly in the STEM fields. We all know and was very uh, incited about and enamored with his Meyerhoff Scholarship Program. He started a few decades ago, and that was just the beginning to the innovation that he's brought in STEM education. He's won far, far too many awards for me to recount here today, but he's been named one of America's best leaders uh, by US News and Time Magazine has ranked him among the top 10 college presidents. And he later, they named him to one as the 100 most influential people in the world. His own research in public, yes. His own research and publication focus on science and math education with special emphasis on minority participation and performance. He earned his master's degree in mathematics and his doctorate here from the College of Education here at the University of Illinois. So thanks to both of you, my friends and colleagues, for being here. So now, Dr. Rabrowski, it's my pleasure to invite you to take the podium and to get this conversation started. Again, thank you for being here. Thank you, Robert. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. I am delighted to be here. I am, uh, I am your product. I like saying that, that I am of the University of Illinois. And I, I had several things. I, I did not want um, the, your president, your chancellor rather, to leave New York 
He was part of a, of a consortium with me there uh, at SUNY Albany, as I recall. But when he said he was coming to, to this place, to Champaign-Urbana, I said, then that's okay. You can go there. All right, you can go there. And I didn't want Wanda Ward to leave NSF because we all relied on her so much. But when she said she was coming here, I said, that's okay, somehow. <laughs> but I, I am so honored to say that I stand on the shoulders of many people here who've gone on. David Dodds Henry was a mentor. Uh, actually, after he retired, he taught, and he taught in leadership, and had an amazing seminar with him, uh, and, and spent time talking a lot about language and the importance of written and spoken language. He was a PhD in English, just as Greta Hogan, who was an advisor to me for so many years and who worked in Upward Bound and other programs, was in English. And, and I say that because when I think about universities and leadership, I think about language skills in particular, one's ability to communicate effectively, both in person and in written form. And those people stand out. I came back last month and spoke at Clarence Shelley, who had a background in English also, as it turns out, as you might expect. And then the other name I want to mention that really is one that some of you would know would be Jack Pelterson, who had been a mentor of mine and pushed me to come work with ACE on the board there. Um, and I had been so admiring of him when he was here. And, and most important right now, I'm serving as this Centennial Fellow for ACE. And so we're working on everything from the Carnegie classifications. Uh, I was very proud that my young campus, we are 100 years younger than you, and we just became Research One. So give us a round of applause for that. <laughs> uh, but ACE is also, and so it's working on classifications in other areas that you may have seen that will be significant to you, such as um, socioeconomic mobility, which is an area, and, and every university will be classified, given a classification there. I think it's an area where you will do well, and it's important that you look at that sooner than later. And I don't know whether you've been through the ACE internationalization effort. That's another one that's very important. We went through that, and we thought we knew it a lot. We have students from 100 countries, and we assume we, but we had a lot to learn. And that gets to the point of my book, the most recent one that my colleagues and I wrote was entitled The Empowered University. And the subtitle is Shared Leadership, Culture Change, and Academic Success. And three notions. Number one, the idea of that it's not about me as just the chancellor or the president, it's about all of us. That was his point today, which is very important, that we should feel empowered to take a leadership role in the shaping of this institution. Number two, culture change. If you look at Eric Weiner's book, The Geography of Bliss, it says, culture is the sea we swim in, so all-consuming that we fail to recognize it until we step out of it and look back at ourselves. And this is what the chancellor was saying to you today. We need to look at what we've done well and at the same time where we need to move and do, and to have the tough conversations, which I hope we can discuss some today. And then finally, this idea of, of academic success, both for our students, undergrad and grad, and for our faculty and our staff. How do we work to look at what's going well and how we can improve? And so there are two or three things I would say. Number one, I was honored to be with a number of University of Illinois people when I was inducted into the National Academy of Engineering a few weeks ago, there were the faculty members from here, but you should know there were a number of people there who noticed that I was a graduate of Illinois. He came up to say, Illini. It was very nice, especially because it's a, that world is especially private university oriented, as you know. But Illinois was shining bright that day, all right? And it is in all these societies. Number two, I think about the fact that uh, you have made such progress with looking at the grand challenges, not just of engineering, but of our society, from looking at everything from uh, challenges involving energy to clean water, sustainability, those kinds of things. The grand challenge that I don't think we have spent enough time on in our society, not just for engineering or for the social sciences, is this future of democracy. This is a part of what the chancellor was saying this morning. We are in a very challenging time and 25 years from now, our next generation will say, where were you, the University of Illinois? Where were you, American higher education, when the future of our society was being shaped? And the ineluctable question that we should all be asking is, are we as universities merely a reflection of society, 
or do we accept our role in helping to shape the future of society? I would hope it would be as much the second as not, as not the first. And so as I close, because I'm looking forward to the conversation, I want you to think about this notion of, of who are we as a society of people from so many different backgrounds. 60% of my students have a parent from another country, whether it is from uh, one of the islands or from Russia or wherever. Uh, you have more diverse now than ever before. You are under 50%, you're probably 40, 30% white, which could not have been expected when I was here back in the 70s. You've really increased numbers of Hispanic students and Asian students, and I applaud you for that. Our largest minority on my campus is Asian, in fact, Asian American. Uh, I want to challenge you with the challenge that we still face that Du Bois talked about in 1900, and that is of race. We still have such small percentages of blacks in American higher education on campuses like this. You do better than a place like Michigan. I looked at the numbers. I work with them a lot. You do better than some others. But being mediocre among those who are poor is not special. <laughs> do you that? You may quote me on that. You may quote me on that. And I mean, you've made progress. You've got Robert Jones here. And I should tell you, as a president, older than most, um, he is highly regarded, highly regarded, and Illinois goes up as they look because he's having light shining on you. Give your chancellor a round of applause, would you please? <laughs> and finally, finally, I, I want you to think about the holy grail in American higher education, the professoriate, the professoriate. I'm honored that this new Howard Hughes program is named after me, and they're putting $1.5 billion into producing a more diverse scientific workforce. It's wonderful. First of all, when something is named after you, you feel like you're dead somehow, let me just say. <laughs> but I get over that because I'm alive and wanting, I'm wanting, I'm wanting Illinois to be very involved in that. My campus with the Maryland Medical School just got that first grant, the NIH first grant, right? Those are grants that you want to be getting and to be known for. You are already in the top 15 in the production of black kids who are going to get PhDs in the life sciences. You're in the, you're in the top 15. Give yourselves a round of applause for that. <laughs> but nobody knows it. You get my point? You know, the Midwest, let me just give you this, this constructive criticism. You all are so even, you don't brag a lot on yourselves. Those of us on the coast, east and west, we, we like telling people we're number one in the production of blacks who are going to get PhDs in the natural sciences and engineering and number one in producing black kids who get MD PhDs. Give us a big round of applause for that. We say it all the time. We say it all the time. And the black woman who created the vaccine with Bunny Graham at NIH was one of our Mahoff scholars, first black woman in the world to create a vaccine. Big round of applause and goosebumps and goosebumps. And there is my point that I want all of you to be as passionate as Robert about what you do well so that people know it because it will help you attract more people. And I want to challenge my friends in the National Academy of Engineering. I want you to be up there with UMBC and Georgia Tech in producing black kids in engineering. And similarly in social sciences, of all the things I can say, you produce leaders. I remember when I was here before, the chair of philosophy at Harvard was a young white woman, a graduate of, U of uh, Illinois. You produce leaders. I want you to think about how you produce leaders for the academy and society across the races, even building on the strength right now. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs>
all of us who have walked the president walk revere you. 30 years, 30 years. And look how great he looks. It's an, <laughs> I, I think it is amazing. So. Yes, it's, it's really a legacy. Um, I, I think as far as a leadership role model, we've got two leaders with us today in Chancellor Jones and President Rabowski that are amazing people, um, both in the way they live and in what they do and what they're doing for those they serve, kind of a theme of the day. I think this, the thread that President Rabowski pulled was shaping the future of society and democracy is a very important theme that will cut across of some, some of what I'm going to say as well. Now, as I talk, I want you to remember that I am of you. Uh, I think my job is to be a little uh, provocative, to push just a little, um, and I'm doing it with the deepest of respect for you, for what you do, for what you do for society, and for all the great things that are happening here, of which there are so many. Um, so I want you to know that as I talk. And what I want to talk about a little bit is what I think is really a national movement that I hope we can inspire a little bit. It is a dangerous business to start telling other people what they should do, as the chancellor sort of asked us to do. So I'm going to try not to go quite that far, but just to give you some things to think about. As we look at the national horizon, I think we see a movement happening around us. President Rabowski alluded to it in what Ace Carnegie is doing. As we look at a whole new Carnegie classification, we anticipate a future where socioeconomic outcomes are going to move up to the forefront. What are we actually doing for the students we serve when they leave us? There are a lot of ways to think about outcomes, and I will not and do not want to limit it to economic ones only. But I also think if we're not delivering the economic outcomes, it's pretty hard to think very much about what comes beyond that. So that's a little bit of a theme. Now, we know we focused heavily on access for a very long time. Rightly so, we focused on attainment for a long time. We can sort of see what's happening now that we're beginning to think and talk and measure what outcomes can a student expect when they come to us, when they invest their time and their resources in us. And what do we really know about what happens to people after they leave? Definitely progress made with access. Progress made, and then somewhere in there we realized access without completion was a hollow promise. We were not fully delivering. Now I think we're kind of at the same place. After a national movement toward attainment, we say, and yet, are we serving society as we should and as we need to? And what can we tell people about the outcomes they can expect? So we see some signs of stress in the system, right? We see for individuals who don't have bachelor's degrees over the last little period, declining confidence that this is gonna be worth it for them, that it will help them in their future, that it will help them advance their career. Those are pretty big percentage drops in a short amount of time. This is a trend that's been coming. So the prosperity that we're talking about and celebrating here today is not happening equally for everyone. And I think it's pretty important that we acknowledge that and think about this position of strength that we're in. What could we do more to help address? When you think about this, the first slide is the people that are not, that don't have bachelor's degrees. And this is the one of your current students, of our current students nationally. About half of them are not so sure that this degree is gonna be worth the cost. That's, that's stunning. And as we think about shaping the future of society, what does that mean? Now, I would also tell you that enrollment nationally is declining. You are not experiencing it here, right? You have growth, you have exciting things to celebrate, and yet you are experiencing it here because these are your teachers and your colleagues and your future. This is us. When I look at the state of Indiana, I've now lived just a little ways away, so I'm not really a Hoosier, but I'm kind of an honorary Hoosier. Um, in the last, I think it's three years, the percentage of students who are going anywhere to seek any credential or degree after they graduate from high school has dropped from 65% to 53%. That should scare us all. Who will be 
here with us in terms of an educated society and what are we doing about that? There is something happening that is separating individuals that is very unhealthy and when we think about shaping the future of a healthy society, we have to consider this part of our responsibility as well. Um, I think, uh, I'm gonna just say for a minute, now you could easily say, but we do great here. We do great things. You do do great things. You do miraculous things. You're the envy of so many around you. And at the same time, we have the opportunity to think about what else we could do. When you look at, this is a study, it's kind of an amazing study because it's a huge study of about four million individuals and it's a very different kind of data than we usually use. LinkedIn um, analysis of what happens to people after they get a bachelor's degree nationally. What kind of jobs do they go to immediately, five years out and 10 years out. The analysis is a college level job is a job where the majority of postings for that job requires a bachelor's degree. Very gross sort of assessment. Um, and otherwise, underemployment is a college degree person who is not going to a job that requires a bachelor's degree. So if you look at this, and you could say of every 10 individuals that graduate nationally, first job, six of them are finding their way to a college level job, four of them are not. Now maybe that doesn't surprise you, maybe you say that's what happens to people right out of the gate, but this works itself out over time, does it? Five years later, six in a college level job, four of them not in a college level job. The interesting thing is uh, one of each group shifts. Somebody not in a college job makes their way in. Somebody who was in a college level job finds their way out. And then 10 years later, seven of the 10 have made their way to a college level job. It's really kind of a remarkable thing to say there's probably significant income gap for those people at every step of the way. Um, now we begin to say, what could we do, right? What could we do? So we look at what's happening nationally. President Rabowski mentioned the Ace Carnegie effort. I think that's a real sign for our nation that as we think about the longstanding Carnegie classification that we are saying we want to know what happens. Are we providing the socioeconomic lift that we promise when individuals uh, come to our institution? So we might be happy to be an R1, but what if institutions turn out to be an, R5, an E5, right? Great in your research profile, not so great in the socioeconomic mobility lift that you provide your students. And I think this is, this is a sign that this is moving beyond a fringe group and into the core business of what we do. Lots of others along the way. The state of Texas, I have to give them a shout out. They're kind of amazing. They have remarkable data on what happens to, at the program level to individuals after they leave their institutions and every type of program across every institution. It's pretty amazing. There's a movement happening. They've got 25 states that have joined them on the Post-Secondary Economic Outcomes Commission. It's, it's changing. Things are happening around us. Alumni outcomes. This is, a, this is survey data asking people what happens to them. So do, do you make more than $50,000? So a tangible indicator of income. Did, do you perceive that your degree was valuable? And did, it, did you achieve your goals? Getting a little bit of educational satisfaction and fulfillment here, right? You can see the numbers. Now, what's really striking, though, is that not everyone is performing. You could, first of all, say, gosh, that's lower than I would have hoped, right? And then what about everyone? When we look at um, individuals who are black versus their white peers, there's a 14 percentage point difference. Women and men, another 14 percentage point difference. And, and this is just looking at the income target. And then first generation students versus those who have family members, parents that have uh, been to college. So now you're saying, but this is a huge societal issue. This isn't just a University of Illinois issue. And of course you'd be right. Perhaps though, there are things we can do in post-secondary ed and training that could facilitate better outcomes for more people. Here's one. After program of study has been removed statistically, individuals who have one paid internship during their undergraduate years have a $3,000 income boost in their first job. Something is happening when you have a paid internship that opens doors, teaches professional skills, helps you develop confidence. 
don't know exactly what. We're beginning to understand a little bit more about what are the skills that are happening there. But this is one that stands up as helping level the play field, something to think about. However, who's getting those paid internships right now? Again, after correcting for program of study and other demographic variables, we are not providing those paid internships equitably. This is an area where we could do much better. I think, actually, this is a good place to say, of all the people in the room, how many of you have gotten, maybe you shouldn't raise your hands for this, uh, just, so I'll just rhetorically ask the question. Um, <laughs> You know, certainly as a dean, as a person in the provost's office, as a provost, as a president, neighbors, friends, people I knew calling me, most of them educated themselves, college uh, graduates, could you please help my kid, get them an internship, this kid needs a really good experience, I'm looking for a job on campus, right? These are the people that know, that have a contact that reach out. I mean, I'm just guessing we've all had those conversations or those calls, and we've all done it. What happens when we do that? It's not bad or wrong to do that for people, but we are perpetuating the same thing happening over and over. How many students have you met? Superstar, wonderful, wonderful students that will say, I'm on my fourth internship. In fact, this happened to me in Washington, D.C., uh, uh, Tuesday morning, out walking. I, I'm, it's in the dark, it's pitch dark. And this person came up and said, President Watkins, President Watkins, I'm here on an internship. I'm like, wow, this is my fifth one and I'm in Congress and I'm doing this. And in my mind I think, what would happen if we said, not that that's wrong that that student got that internship, but what if every Pell student on this campus, every Pell recipient could count on an internship? Because you would say we're going to serve those students who face the greatest barriers first. What if every first generation student on your campus had that opportunity? Better yet, what if we had federal policy that helped us do that, that said a condition of taking Pell Grant money on your campus is a boost for you and provide those jobs on campus, provide a paid internship. This is how this will be different. So there are some things we know we can do. I wanna talk just for a second about skills and then I'm out of the way. Um, we know that what's happening in these experiences, students are gaining skills in certain ways. I think we're great at some of these core skills. You can imagine the places you're doing this. Verbal and written communication, critical thinking, yep, absolutely. Probably also some very strong opportunities to learn interpersonal competence from leadership opportunities all across campus, developing team skills. You also wanna ask about some of these advanced and specialized skills that really help students find their ways to jobs, first jobs and advancement data analytics and statistics, project management. What I want to tell you is, this is what the new thinking is. Out of the business of thinking, students come here to be able to create their fifth job. Of course they do. They're going to be the, the innovators of the future. And we can help them develop the skills that will allow them to land a good first job. We can do both. We don't have to push this into either or thinking. It's both and thinking. This is the University of Texas example. They are approaching this with a certificate, a set of certificates available to students in particular majors to say broadly educated, absolutely, we want those psychology degrees, those history degrees, those English degrees. We know that matters and we can provide bundles that will allow students the skills that will get them into the first job with a significant earnings boost that's now documented. This is a great example of what what an institution like this can do as you look forward. So, kind of the call to action, how do we achieve a more equitable future through what we do? I think it's gonna take some more intentional actions, some data-informed and scalable solutions. And in the context of this great institution, you are starting in such a position of strength, everyone looks at you as a role model. What could happen here to truly shape a more equitable future? Thanks. Okay, well, uh, thank you, uh, uh, 
pr President Zabrowski and Watkins for those uh, uh, provocative remarks. If you do have questions, uh, please let me encourage you to, to write them down and share them with our staff. Laura will be gathering them in the back um, and uh, uh, bringing them up front and uh, uh, they can contribute to our conversation today. Um, so please, uh, we, we wanna hear from you uh, and engage. Um, We'll spend the rest of our time together having a conversation, you know, prompt you all with some questions uh, and uh, hope we can get this started. Uh, so just to kick us off, uh, when we invited you, of course, uh, we shared a copy of our strategic plan, the next 150. Um, and I know you spent time studying it on the plane while you were coming here. Uh, and you will recall uh, from your uh, uh, studying in the document that uh, our aspiration is to be the top public research institution with a land grant mission in the country. As you know, we're here kicking off our strategic planning process for the next five years to be boldly Illinois. As we think about that aspiration, what sort of goals, what, what do you suggest should be our goals and, and priorities uh, to help us move forward toward, toward that uh, uh, ultimate objective? First of all, a shout out to someone that, if you've been here a long time, you would remember. Bob Waller was the Dean of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and I had an amazing internship under him uh -huh. as a grad Very student. Good. And it, I learned so much from that college about being a president, quite frankly. And the other name I want to, I'm here to speak tomorrow at Jim Anderson's retirement and learned so much from him as a, as a senior graduate student and beginning mm -hmm. faculty member. And, and, that, and the point I would make is that Having mentors and role models can make such a difference. They really can. Now, to answer your question, uh, first of all, I'm going to say I, I, I applaud the chancellor and others on your fundraising. And you're going to need to be even bolder, <laughs> even bolder, because I always look at you in Michigan. Let me just say that. And, and I think one of the reasons for the difference is that, Mich that Illinois has all these private institutions, just being honest. I mean, it's the same challenge we have in Maryland. We have Hopkins. So after they've gotten a wonderful institution, we work very closely with them. A lot of my graduates are there now. The head of APL, Applied Physics Lab, is a UMBC PhD in computer science. We're very, very proud of that. At the same time, we get some money after they've got the big bucks, right? Now, you've got these wonderful private institutions here in a way that Michigan does not. And so the state thinks differently about how it spreads the money. It's been amazing what you've been able to do so far. To get to where you're talking about, though, clearly, when you look at Texas as the largest public endowment with 12 billion or so, you know, you think about that, right? Um, it is going to take uh, even more investment in fundraising and friend raising to get people. The other part I'm going to mention is something we've learned at my university that preparing, we, we 60% of our students are in science and engineering and they go on and do great things as doctors and scientists, whatever. But uh, the people who become the policy people, and the legislators make a huge difference. The fact that the head of the Maryland House of Delegates is our psychology graduate, first woman, first black, is a major, major billion dollar advantage for us. I can say that because when you have graduates in the legislature who will fight for you, it makes all the difference in the world. And so fundraising and thinking intentionally how to produce more leaders who have a lot of influence over public policy in the state. Those are the two things I would say. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm having a problem here with my loud voice. And finally, can you hear me now? <laughs> you still can't hear me. No, can you hear me now? <laughs> Just very quickly, the idea of, of building a cadre of public policy leaders who can help shape policies about higher education, public higher education in the state of Illinois because that will mean so much more money. And secondly, investing more. You look at what your investment is, I have no idea what it is, but your investment in infrastructure for fundraising compared to places who have two and three times as much money, like a Michigan, I guarantee you, investing more will lead, it takes money to make money. Those are the two things I think about. I love those answers. And he didn't tell me to say that. He really didn't, no. right? <laughs> Very <don't> <laughs> Really fabulous responses. And I think as I look at some of the things that I just talked about, that we both just talked about, <clears throat> you see the real potential to make a difference is going to be systemic and policy oriented. Yeah. So yeah. absolutely yeah. spot on. Yeah. Think about what you are doing here, what you want to do in the next five years that could shape 
policy in the state and beyond, because that is how you, we will ultimately achieve that healthy future that we're looking for. So I do, I do want to say, what does it mean to you to want to be the top research university? What do you mean by that? Um, surely not rankings, right? Rankings are the outcome of doing the right thing. You want to do the work that matters, both to you and to others. Mm -hmm. And I think as you, this is when Illinois is at its best, right? When you are doing that work to mat that matters to this institution and to your communities and to the national and global community. And I will tell you that you do this so well and you do it all the time. I'm thinking you among the first, right, to stand up COVID testing in this rapid, ubiquitous way. And we at the University of Utah, we're not very far behind you. Why? Not because we're great. I mean, of course, I should say that. Well, I don't know if this is being streamed. I mean, I should, of course, the University of Utah is great. But, but you know why we were able to do that? Because Paul Hergenrother from your chemistry department would jump on a Zoom call with me and the director of academic medicine when he was going a thousand directions trying to really get this stood up and help us in our pathology lab figure out how to do it on our campus with no sense of what am I getting out of this? Is there something in it for me? But literally I could text or email Paul, I don't remember how I did it, and the next day he's willing to be on a call with us and basically share everything he knew about what you all were doing. How great is that about this university? That is what it means to be a top ranked university, not any of the other sorts of external things. You do those things well, you are a top-ranked university. So I think it is important to say, what do you mean by that? And that shapes what you ought to do. But don't give up on those great Paul Hergenrothers out there that so generously and openly share what they're doing and learning for the benefit of everyone around them. Yeah, well, just, let me just add one point. You, you have this opportunity to show American higher education, how we go about shaping, shaping the society we want to become. I'm gonna give you an example. It means tough conversations, and it means calling out the elephants in the room. So let me do one, all right? I was an activist as a child with Dr. King. I want you all to applaud those students in the back for caring so deeply about the issue of divesting from fossil fuel. Give them a round of applause for caring so deeply about the issue. And I appreciate the respectful way that they are exerting their American right to speak up in that respectful way. Every university doesn't have that advantage. Even your first group was very respectful. They said what they had to say, and they left. I know places where they don't leave. So give, <laughs> give your other grad students a round of applause. <laughs> That's very nice, very nice, very nice. Just, so having what we call retriever courage, the name of our, of our mascot is uh, the Chesapeake Bay Retriever. His name is True Grit. We say we're the house of grit. But retriever courage is the courage to listen to things we may not want to hear. Mm -hmm. Whether it's about the way women are treated or issues involving sexual assault or, and, and harassment or issues of race or poverty or the critical big issues about energy. Having that teaching other institutions, for example, how to listen to what may be easy and may not be easy, mm -hmm. and having the conversations. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you, can you hear me, right? Yeah. Um, well, let me just say again, I certainly, Ruth, appreciate your comments about uh, how our faculty and our staff reached out to assist uh, you as you, like many, uh, Utah, like many institutions, were really trying to figure out, you know, in this new uh, COVID environment, how do you sustain yourself? How do you keep the community safe and move forward? And I just can't emphasize, I tried to allude to that several times in my comments, but the bottom line is that I'm so proud of our faculty for having that mindset of not getting caught up. They knew they had something unique, <laughs> They knew they had something that was going to save lives and transform society. But I can tell you, those three individuals that led the laboratory that came up with this test said pretty unequivocally, we're not worried about 
patenting this technology. We'll worry about that later. They were pretty much absolutely committed to leaving it kind of open source because they reminded us of the land grant mission. What it means to be a land grant mission in the 21st century is the embodiment of that roof. That is what for us it means to be a land grant university with a global commitment as well as one that's committed to serving the common good. That's the epitome, I think. To me, that's the land grant mission in real time. We've lived it over the almost the last three years and demonstrated what it means to be a land grant university. Now we got to carry that forward to what does it mean in terms of how we serve the public, what we teach, how we teach it, and how we are going to be the drivers of the economic vitality of the state of Illinois, the Midwest, and actually parts of the U.S. of A. So to me, it's all about kind of redefining and rethinking what it means to be a land grant university. And I think that clearly has the opportunity to gain greater light, greater perspective through this boldly Illinois strategy. So I do appreciate you sharing that because uh, it wasn't just the faculty, our students were just some of the most absolutely amazing young people I've ever had a chance to work with. Whatever hoop we asked them to do, they, a few of them, you know, didn't exactly toe the line, but the vast majority of them did whatever we asked them to do, and they did it several times. And I could not be more proud of what they were able to do. So thank you. So in, in both of your presentations, you talked about the importance of more equitable campuses. Um, and equity is something that we need to think about, needs to be embedded into the, the fabric of, of an institution to make a difference. Can you talk about ways uh, about how you've been able to create cultures on your campuses that priori prioritize equity and make some suggestions about how we might think about going about doing the same here? Sure, I, I make this distinction in, with my campus and colleagues between equity and equality. Um, we can put two people at the beginning of a race and say you have the equal opportunity to win this race. One person has been training for years in marathons and the other person has a broken leg. In other words, not the academic skills he or she needs. And we say, run the race, this is equal. It is not. Equity has to do with this notion of outcomes. Can you hear me? Is that better? That's what you were telling me, I'm sorry. <laughs> equity has everything to do with the notion, with my big mouth, I couldn't, and, with outcomes. And, and so what we've worked to do is to look at not only what we're doing on our campus, and there's an article we wrote on a theory of change, of how you change the university, so that people who are from underrepresented groups become a part of the mainstream of the campus, and not simply the office on the side, quite frankly. It's a very important, it's a sensitive point, but it's wrong. Are the people involved in diversity, equity, and inclusion a part of the mainstream of the campus? You've made some wonderful strides in the diversity of the leadership, but when you go down the ladder and then you look in departments, what's happening there? And the other part that may not be so obvious when thinking about Illinois, when thinking about our country and equity, is that just look at the recent NAEP data. Poor children went even further behind than they were before COVID in math and reading. And we may give scholarships to first generation kids, but if they can't read, they can't come, and if they come, they are not going to succeed. And yet we have a grand challenge of personalized learning and using technology. We have to, as research campuses, think broadly and deeply about how we know, how we use what we know about learning and about technology to reach these communities of people across races who are not learning to read and fundamental mathematics. If we're gonna talk about bringing more into the, into the pipeline, you, I looked at the data, you're number 12 or 13 in best educated in the, in the state, in the country, excuse me. We take pride, Massachusetts is first, we're normally some, number two. Massachusetts, 43% bachelors. Maryland, 40%. You're at 35%, not bad. You're, you're slightly ahead of Michigan, by the way. I keep, <laughs> I, I know what, get somebody the hair up. <laughs> But what I would say is you want to be better than that. We want a larger percentage. And that's going to take reaching out to get more people prepared to take advantage of the scholarships mm -hmm. you're talking about. So I think um, I would say, kind of building on that, the, in some ways if the question is what have I done, what mm -hmm. have we done yeah. on equity, I would say not enough, clearly. 
and our work remains in, in front of us. <coughs> Certainly, as you think about bold aspirations for the future of this institution, wouldn't it be great if you were a crucial contributor in changing that story that President Robowski just talked about? If you look now at how income predicts who goes to college, who finishes college, who makes their way through, individuals with the same talent and aptitude are so much less likely to make their way if they're from a lower income group. Would it, would it be fabulous if your bold aspirations for 2030 were that that graph did not look like that anymore, that Raj Chetty was out of business in terms of those studies of how socioeconomics alone predicts people's destiny? That is work worth doing every day. That's what a top rate rated public university does, makes a difference on that significant issue. I think the other thing I would say there is, um, and this is maybe just a little pokey, so, or you know, a little provocative, so I'm just gonna hope that you're not gonna hold this against me. You know, as you look at the incredible success of this institution, and I'm thinking about, uh, maybe I should just use my state that I live in now, and that 12% enrollment drop, that people leaving high school doing any post-secondary credential of any type, while Purdue and Indiana are both celebrating 10% enrollment increases. This, this is our problem. This needs to be our problem because what that will mean for shaping the future of society and democracy, right? And that means your community college partners need your help and your true partnership. Those regional four years do too. And an easy answer would be to say there's just too many here in this state or wherever in my hypothetical state. Um, better to say though, <clears throat> what does the leading public research university in the nation do about that? How do we help? What's our role in our job? Mm -hmm. We know the vast majority of people cannot or do not relocate to go to college. So what if their local entity dies? declines, becomes so poor quality. This shapes an unhealthy future for America. So that I think is, is that's, put, that's a push in a direction that takes work. Um, I just put it out there as a possibility. You know, just adding to that, I, I, I was privileged to, to chair the Margaret Casey Foundation in Seattle. And we looked at the, the states that have the poorest, the largest numbers of poor children. What states do you think they are? Everybody says Mississippi. They might say his state, Georgia, my state, Alabama. Um, but it's actually Illinois, California, New York, Texas, Florida. Mm -hmm. Now, the secret is this. you got the largest number of poor children and the largest number of rich children. You are a microcosm of the country, the gap. You get my point? Seems to me a part of that goal is to narrow that gap somehow. And the other mm -hmm. one I'm going to give you is a very specific challenge. We worked with Penn State, UMBC worked with Penn State and Chapel Hill to prove that large public universities could create Meyerhoff-like programs to become a leader in producing black scientists. And they've done it. We have a science piece showing they've done it with Howard Hughes money. Chan Zuckerberg is now working on it with Latino kids for Berkeley and San Diego. Well, I learned so much from my experience at, UMB, at, at Illinois working with the Upward Bound program in reading and math, all the way to working with the, the, the Equal Opportunity program that helped to shape, along with what I got from Hampton, the Myhoff program. So Myhoff is really a product of you all. We're the leading program in the country. You need to be in that space. I told Harvard this, given that they have $50 billion, I said they should beat us, right? You have as many black students on your campus as I have on mine. I'm gonna challenge you in not just the life sciences, but in the engineering and social sciences to produce more people of color for the professoriate. There is a part of the world of a leading research university. Georgia Tech is doing that for grad students now in a big way, for new presidents, black presidents, who have been deans of engineering or coming out of engineering at Rice right now, mm -hmm. out of California. Illinois has done some of that and can do much more. That's the idea. Did you want to come in on this, Chancellor? You know, I, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm. By the way, the Chancellor has on shoe, on socks 
the color of your university. I've never seen that before in my life. Give him a round of applause. He's got on socks to say. He is bleeding, Illinois. <laughs> I love it. Well, now I wish I'd have worn my blue suit coat with the block eye lining. So <laughs> then you really would have been impressed. <laughs> no, this is, a, I mean, this is spot on what, what both of our, our, our guests are saying, uh, is that we have a real opportunity to really be bold. And that's why we call this process Boldly Illinois. Because I can tell you our Midwest modesty are tweaking around the edges yeah, yeah. of these big ideas. Folks, it's not going to get us to where we need to be. And uh, we called our last strategic planning process the next 150 because we fundamentally believe that the decisions that we make each and every year is going to contribute what we look like in the next 5, the next 10, the next 20, the next 100 years. Now we've moved to Boldly, Illinois, as a way of saying, you know, we have come a long way with this strategic plan, but in order for us to move the dial, in order for us to close some of these gaps of inequity, we're going to have to not only think out of the box, we've got to act out of the box. And we've got to create the partnerships and the strategies. And to do what I said earlier that uh, Dr. Wrabrowski just alluded to, we've got models out there. We don't have to, we, one thing about this place, we're not so arrogant to think that all the big ideas have to come from us. We simply have to borrow from, adapt and modify strategies, data-driven strategies that we know work. Hope Chicago works, Meyerhoff Scholarship works. And there are countless other programs out there that we've been kind of tweaking around the edges on. We just have to have the wherewithal to step up to the plate and convince leaders in the state, politicians in the state, those that control the purse strings to support us as we try to innovate and in making sure you can invest all kinds of money thinking you're going to become the next center of excellence and in innovation. If you're not dealing with the fundamental issue of, of equality in education, you're not gonna get there. If you're not investing in those that can, do, that can read by third grade and do math by fourth grade, you're not going to get there. And much too often we get looked at as being the downstream solution to all of these problems. It doesn't work. We're not in the business of trying to remediate for the shortcomings of a K through 12 education system that needs some additional thinking and some additional innovation. We do our part and we are not suffering from the en uh, enrollment cliff that a lot of universities are going to have to contend with. But you've heard me say time and time again, I cannot sit here comfortably knowing what's happening at the other public universities in the state and think that ultimately this university is going to be okay a decade from now because I can guarantee you it will not. So this is where we have to step up and lead in order to shape the paradigm, in order to shape the narrative of what university, higher education is going to look like in the state of Illinois. If we don't do it, folks, it's frankly not going to happen. And we have to do it through partnerships. So, Ruth, I want to come back to your, your presentation. That's okay. And, you know, you presented some data uh, uh, about uh, changing attitudes toward college uh, from potential students and their parents about whether it was worthwhile uh, to attend. Um, and what the impact of that was. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about what, what we could do uh, to help address sort of that, that changing narrative about the, the potential uh, for, for uh, higher education and, and the doors it opens uh, uh, for a future. And I think it kind of comes down to, a, you know, at one level, a simple question. If you, if you were talking to a high school senior um, and uh, they asked you, why, why should I consider college? Uh, you know, uh, why not go, go to night school? Um, um, what, how do you answer that? Uh, how, you know, and, and is it just economic, or, or is there something broader, uh, other, other sorts of uh, ways to, to respond to that question to convince them and their parents that, that, that this is worth it? Yes. So 
I think a lot of the threads of responding to that question are in the dialogue today. Mm -hmm. I think the certainly um, people choose or think about their post high school experience with a credential, an associate's degree, a degree, for many different reasons. And I think it's important for us to acknowledge that socioeconomic reasons, that a job is one component of that. And there are many elements of fulfillment, access to meaningful work, and all the benefits that go with a post-secondary ed degree or credential that are important to people. I would say that probably the most common reason is that people are saying, I want to know that there's a job and, mm -hmm. a, and I can earn a living wage on the other side. I, I think about how this has changed over my career and I, uh, in the summers long ago, I'm looking around this room for somebody who was around during that time when I first came in 93. Um, I would do <laughs> summer orientation sessions. You know, it was a way for an assistant professor to make a little extra money. And you'd go talk to students and parents that were coming to enroll in course. It was fun. I always enjoyed it. And when you, people talked about you know, what was going to happen to them or what courses they were going to take or what they were interested in, I'm looking at my friend Christy. I learned a lot from Christy, actually, back in those early days. Um, the, uh, rarely would people ask you what job is on the other side of this. It's really an interesting thing to think about this 30-year lens. And I can tell you that when I left the University of Utah, I still used to go do those summer orientation things because they're fun. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a single one where the majority of questions weren't, will my kid get a job? Is there a job on the other side of this for me? I really want to study psychology, but what am I going to do? What's going to happen to me at the end? Something has happened here in the world around us that people want to know there will be a tangible outcome for them. And there is nothing about that that takes away any of the other wonderful things that happen for people in terms of meaning, purpose, and fulfillment. I do think that if we want to recapture public trust in a broader way, being willing to talk about that and document it and measure it and make it more user friendly to access the data about what's on the other side is an okay thing. There's a big movement of that happening around us. We see it in all those measures of outcomes. Rather than fighting it, I'd recommend embracing it. And I would also recommend saying that broadly, Broad knowledge and specific skills are a great combination for those kind of outcomes. Mm -hmm. And just reinforcing what the chancellor said, um, I, fi I figured out somehow it got turned off. Yeah, uh, uh, here's the point. Jim, Jim Collins talks about the genius of the and versus the tyranny of the or. So when we talk about the broad liberal education, yes, we want people who can think critically and communicate effectively and we have certain values. And at the same time, families do want to know that we have a sense of what's going to happen to my daughter or son, whether she majors in the humanities, social sciences or whatever. And so what we've worked to do on my campus is to connect disciplines much more so in innovative ways. And so when you talked about, uh, for example, we've put a thread of technology throughout the social sciences, humanities, and the arts, imaging and digital arts, digital humanities, data science at this intersection of statistics and the social sciences and computation. And working with the Greater Washington Partnership and others um, have worked with companies on their looking for liberal arts graduates who've had some background. NSF has grants in the X plus these different areas. And so more and more we need to think about not one area or the other, but how we use these marketable skills in thinking about broadly educated people with technology being a critical factor for all of us in any discipline, from education to social work to whatever it is, and most important, internships. I mean, your point about, I mean, there's no doubt. People, the reason they make more money clearly is they have stronger skills. They know they're not going to be CEO of a company. They know what it means not to work with their phone on as a personal matter, I mean, just basic kinds of things. For us, NSA is one of the most enlightened diversity employers I know. Yep. Some faculty get upset when I say it. I think universities are some of the most conservative when it comes to hiring faculty. We know that. But NSA really works to bring in people from different backgrounds. And they start working with students in our area in high school. 
So many of my freshmen have had a year or two of work at the National Security Agency before they get to us. And so we can always tell parents, there's spies watching your kids all the time. <laughs> parents like that. But the point is, it makes such a difference. And that's whether they're going to be majoring in the languages yeah. you know, or whatever. But having the internship technology and connecting marketable skills, very important. If, if I may follow up on, on the, your, the points that both of you just made, it, it, at the end of the day, I think what we're seeing is we have to be a bit more strategic and intentional about the issue of and how we answer honestly when those parents ask the fundamental question, yeah, they're getting a degree, but are they going to be able to find uh, you know, meaningful employment once they graduate? And so I want to throw something out because I wanted to, I definitely want to get your opinion on this is, and Bill and I have been having conversation with this and Gene Robinson and I were up in Chicago at an event last week and we got into a deep discussion about the following. This university, one of the things that I soon learned that sets it apart from many others is the fact that, yeah, we've got 16 colleges, but we've got these 10 multidisciplinary institutes that in many ways kind of serve as the connective tissue across many of the academic opportunities, the research and the scholarship opportunities. I think it lends itself to us being a bit more nimble because we multidisciplinary approaches to finding solutions to problems yes. is in our DNA. I don't think we can speak as strongly about how we deliver the world-class education in a multidisciplinary way. Mm -hmm. So I guess the fundamental question that I hope this strategic planning process will help us better understand is how do we create that same kind of multidisciplinary approach to educating our undergraduate students? We do a much better job, I think, at the right. graduate level. And we've done some innovative things with Computer Science Plus, the yeah. CS Plus programs. That's a good start, but it's not the totality of what I think we need to do. So I was just wondering yeah. if you guys could comment on that. Or do you know of any place that's doing this well? Or is it something that only works on the research and, innov and uh, innovation front? And I know it has to do, I get, every time I ask this question, we, we blank ways, uh, Vicki is in the room somewhere, I know. We talk about the budget model. Yeah. Has been, I see Dean, uh, Cheryl Henley, Maxwell nodding ahead. That is probably one of the biggest problems. But, you know, I don't think we can afford to, and I know we just established, I think, one of the best budget models among research universities in the country where, you know, there is, uh, opportunities for you to keep core resources, but also opportunities to pay for the common good. I get all of that, but I can tell you, I fundamentally believe the university that figures out how to create a multidisciplinary approach to educating our students are the ones that are going to rule the day in the end. That's very nice. Very nice. I've been wrong before, but I think it was 1955. Or <laughs> just, just one comment that adds to that. No, we, we started years ago, a decade ago, with these major innovation grants coming from fundraising and money that we pulled together to ask faculty to look at ways of redesigning courses and thinking, rethinking programs that would emphasize interdisciplinarity across areas engineering, the sciences, the arts, humanities, social sciences, and giving faculty opportunities for release time to think about it, incentives for them to work with others. So you have somebody who may be in technology and somebody in history <coughs> developing a course that looks at, um, amazingly, the riots that we had in Baltimore uh, with Freddie Gray in relationship to 100 years before that when, the, when we had the Civil War, 100 plus years before. That was in the same area. And looking at poverty and racism and those issues and having history majors and computing majors working together on digital technologies, digital humanities. Now that's just an example, but, but across the board, I'm going to make a bold statement because I care about you and I'm going to say it. Uh, research universities, big research universities, usually are far more excited about their grad level education than their undergrad education. The undergrads pay for the bills, 
but I'm just going to say that what we work to do as a much smaller place than you is to have that same excitement about research and undergraduates. So 40 plus percent of my students of every race in STEM go immediately to grad school, which puts us in the category with private institutions. And many of them have published in referee journals along the way. The young woman I mentioned who created the vaccine had a combined major of social sciences and life sciences. And so she had studied HIV for a long time, not just in the biochemistry lab, but also in working with HIV patients and understanding socioeconomic. And we've used that example because she convinced the Moderna people not to move ahead with the, with actually with the virus, uh, with the, the, the vaccine, until we had enough blacks and Latinos in the sample study and convinced me to do it. But she said she learned that not from the sciences, but from the social, social sciences. sciences the distrust in our society. Mm -hmm. Just a great example of what you do when you connect yep. disciplines. Yep. Chancellor, this is an area where you can be the top public research university in the nation. You heard it. This is great. <laughs> I agree. Do it. <laughs> so, uh, you both, we, we, Chancellor, you mentioned 1955. I was yeah. thinking back 55, to- 55, 56, yeah. I don't remember. Uh, <laughs> so, I was thinking back to you know, the, the last half of the 20th century. Uh, mm -hmm. And in the last half of the 20th century, there, there was kind of a, a consensus about the, the role of public universities and higher education. Uh, you know, we could disagree about a lot of things, but everyone agreed that uh, universities were uh, contributed to upward mobility, pillars of society to be, you know, to be uh, to be praised. And, and over the past 20, 30 years, that consensus has broken down. Uh, we know the critiques from the right about bias. Um, we see increasingly critiques from the left about cost and ex you know, exclusion and, and, uh, and so on and so forth. What role does the University of Illinois play? What role can it play in restoring uh, the consensus and the trust in higher education that seems to be diminishing right now? Just start with the idea that uh, you talk about the, the narrative being shaped by the media. Show me families who have had success with their children going to college who don't want their grandchildren to go to college. <laughs> you think about it. I don't care whether they're Republican, Democrats, or whatever. Everybody talks about this declining. But the fact is, once you've seen success, and you know it means a good job, <clears throat> Unless you have a trust fund, you want your child or your relative to go to college. That's just a no-brainer. And yet we hear that over and So one of the things it seems to me you have to do is what we're working to do is to be bold in saying college matters. It really matters. Four-year, the two-year, it really does matter, number one. Let me ask you a question. What percent, when, when we talked about Project 500 in 1968, what percent of Americans do you think in 1968 had graduated from college? Don't be shy. Come on. I heard 5%. Come on. 18. 20? Don't let me say you're risk adverse now. Come on. <laughs> you used to get the knowing so you can get that A, but just come on and ask me. Tell me, what do you think? What'd you say? 3%. 3%? It was 10%. It was 10%. What percent of whites had graduated from college in 1968? 35, 40, 50, it was 11 percent. Mm -hmm. And for blacks, between three and four, and with those were only two groups we were counting. Today, what percent have graduated from college? Four year. What did I hear? 50? See, it's 30 percent. It's about 30 percent. Now, when I say that to my friends of any race, first thing they say is, that couldn't be true. Everybody I know went to college. Duh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> Professors know professors, right? <laughs> lawyers know lawyers. You're around, that's who you're around. But, but two-thirds of American families haven't had anybody graduate from college. And sometimes when somebody went, they didn't graduate and they had debt. There's the issue. We have millions and millions, Ruth will tell you this, who started, this is what she's saying up here, never finished. Well, that's a bad story. That's why even though you have 80-some percent and three quarters in, in the minority groups. Just think about the thousands who don't. So even for you, as well as you do, and you do better than we, we are in the 70s. But the fact is, all those people can go out and say, yeah, I started, and I got debt now, and I never got a degree. 
So, I mean, that's, those are the issues. And then finally, about attitude, who do you think said with the GI Bill? Remember the GI Bill? Who do you think said, we will not want to see veterans in universities? Who do you think said that? They said, if you put veterans in the universities, they will become academic hobo jungles. Quote. If, as a man of history, yep. <laughs> president of the University of Chicago and the president of our most prestigious Harvard said exactly that. You do, and that, they were talking about white men. You get my point? Just ordinary people. There weren't a lot of women, not a lot of people. But I'm, what am I saying? That if you go back to the 40s, the fact is that people just thought if you weren't from privilege, you shouldn't go to college. And even when those first little black kids came and a few Latino kids who came then in 68, you still only had 90%, you had 90% of Americans who hadn't gotten a college degree. Yeah. Today we're up to the third, but the point is we've got to push those numbers. In your state, you're at 35%. The more people have success in college, the more they believe in college. And that's the role you have to play. Yeah. Pretty good response, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you think about the fact that, if you think about other businesses, who would survive, <laughs> right? With 60% mm -hmm. of the people that start actually getting what they came for, yeah. which is about where we are nationally yeah. with yeah, the yeah. bachelor's degree, right? Yeah, yeah. So what does restoring confidence and right. trust mean, and how do we do it? Um, I could imagine a lot of effort for those who started and didn't finish. What could we do? What could we collectively do? We failed those people the first time, right? What should we do for them about that? What do we do to do better for those we're serving now? And then how do we make sure that they achieve the outcomes yeah. they came for? Because yeah. yeah. I think stopping at attainment is also a bit of a contributor to this. Yeah. When you look at that, of every 10 college graduates, yeah. How many of them are in a college level job? I right. have to assume that the four of 10 who are not mm -hmm. aren't feeling so great mm -hmm. about their experience. So I believe that those are very tangible actions. Um, I also think that some of your threads that you've articulated so well, Chancellor, about the role of this institution in genuinely serving community mm -hmm. is a big part of this as well. What are the real needs of the community? What are, on, what are the issues that our people are living now today? And what does this institution do about that for the people locally, in our state, in our nation, and beyond? It is um, really imperative that we put the society we serve first above our interests. And, and I think that sometimes we forget that. Um, you've had great examples of what you do here that does that, and it's a good challenge for a bold Illinois in 2030. And you should be even bold about, again, shouting up from the rooftop when you've got success. I was in Los Angeles last week, and someone heard that I was a graduate of Illinois, and she came up, a Latina, very impressive professional woman who said, I was a member of Project 500. Latinas were a part of the group that came in, and she was so proud. She says, and now look at what I'm doing. It was just, I mean, those stories need to be told so that people, I mean, I love the fact that you got a larger Hispanic population in now. Now the success, you got to tell those stories from those people, whether they're first generation college or others. And back in those communities, mm -hmm. this is what happened to her when she left Illinois. Mm -hmm. She's now in LA, she's doing all these things. You know, that's, it's the boldness of telling the story. That's important. Chancellor, I'm going to give you the last word. I was going to give you the last word. Uh, <laughs> See, that's that Midwestern right way. See, that's that Midwestern <laughs> way. Look, yeah. anyway, in, President Robowski will have the last <laughs> word. <laughs> oh, no. the East Coast, we're going to give me that last yeah. word. Wait a <laughs> I defer to my distinguished colleague for the last word. <laughs> no, we won't pass the buck. I guess the last word for me is simply to our guests, thank you, thank you, thank you and to all of you who've taken time out of a very busy time of the year to come and engage in this conversation and dialogue. Thank you so much. It shows that you really care about the future of this university and that you will be involved in helping us to shape this future. It's going to take each and every one of you. It's going to take identifying where we have the strategic opportunity and where we have the willingness to be bold and step out beyond the traditional boundaries 
to do something that's transformational and impactful, not for ourselves, but for the current and future generations. That's what it's all about, people. So thank you so much, and we will demonstrate, continue to demonstrate what it means to be bold here at the University of Illinois. I thank you so much for all of your support and for your attendance. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Wonderful. Masterful, Mr. Chairman.